Section 5 of The Broken Shaft, Tales in Mid-Ocean. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Broken Shaft, Tales in Mid-Ocean, edited by Henry Norman. Section 5. The Action to the Word by Walter Herries Pollock. One of the greatest, if not the greatest, of the social pleasures of my life has been derived from the hours I have been privileged to spend with my dear old friend and teacher, von Karos, the violinist. The public knows him as a master of his art to a certain extent, and he has always been a favourite with them, but his success and his reputation have never been of the kind that his qualities should have commanded. Here and there only, will you find a true lover of music who, when this or that great name of a violin magician is cited, will say half to himself, if there be no sympathetic soul by his side, Yes, a fine player, but nothing to von Karos if the public did but know it. Say rather, I have heard another amateur add, if he would... But let the public know it. It is far from me to assert that the public was in the wrong in this matter, almost as far as to assert that von Karos was in the wrong. All who have followed the notes as true critics must have observed and have been puzzled by such cases of mutual misunderstanding between artist and audience. Sometimes it comes from what a French critic has called Emotion qui ne dépasse point la rampe, and that the case is, I fear, frequent and grievous, at least to the artist. With von Carus it was not so. The public felt his emotion, and wondered that it did not touch them more nearly. He felt that there was something wanting in his contact with them, and, but I am trying vainly to describe what no description of mine can compass, and must fall back on simple statement of fact derived from what I have seen and heard. The large musical, really musical public, the public of the gallery when Italian opera was an institution in England, and of the orchestra in St. James's Hall now, said among each other, This is wonderful playing, why does it not touch us? The clever stupid public of the stalls, the university young men and young women, who had caught the cant of music and knew one hair's breadth of it from the intellectual side, said, Admirable execution, but he can't touch so-and-so's music. And, so saying, gave a half-sigh, half-snort, which expressed extraordinary acquaintance with modern common-room talk and fell gracefully back into their chairs. Musicians simply wondered. I, whose sole claim to the title of musician is due to the instruction of von Carlos himself, wondered with them, but have wondered somewhat less since I heard one of the many stories he has told me as friend to friend, not as teacher to pupil. He took few pupils. I cannot get away from his fascinating personality, as the modern school has it, and with those few he was not apt to be content. I think he approved of me merely because I had fathomed the depth of my own ignorance, and came to him feeling that, if I were capable of learning at all, I should learn from him more of the heart of the mystery of music than years of the conventional teaching I had already partly acquired could give me. It is already something he would say to me in the days of our first acquaintance, to know that you know nothing of this wonderful thing called music. It has taken me more than half a lifetime to find that out. And you, you know it by instinct. And what is more wonderful, the teaching of the schools has not deprived you of your instinct. Therefore, out of my own ignorance, I will give you whatever hint I can to the finding of the secrets of harmony and melody. Do not tell me, I had not, that the two can be separate for the spirit of music. 
Then he would smoke silently, and then he would give me a lesson profound in knowledge, brilliant in illustration, burning with life and passion. And then he would fall to smoking again and say with a half-assumed sadness, But all this... It is no good to talk to the amateur who wants to find the royal road that exists as much as the road to King Solomon's mines exists. And all this, well, well, I cannot express to the great public that, say what you will, is after all the best judge. With such sayings I always left him to commune in silence, and that is one strong reason why our friendship never faltered. However, it is not with this man, whom I loved almost as the pupil loved Sir Raphael in the beautiful story of Charles Orchester, that I have now to deal so much as with one of the many stories that he told me, the one that threw to my thinking the most light upon his character and career. How he came to tell it was thus. In one of my cherished evenings with him, our talk chanced upon the Huguenot, and von Chaos, who was one of the few German musicians, who deeply admired that Dumas, the father, not the son, of opera, had illustrated some of the soprano passages with a violin, which was excellent in public, inspired in private. Presently he asked me to recall to him, as best I could on the piano, the days when that great work drew a fit, though numerous audience to listen to its fine interpretation at the old Her Majesty's, the days when neither lyric nor dramatic stage in England had been ruined by star salaries and vulgar talk about social status. I played on, von Carlos occasionally stopping me with a reproof or a hint, until we arrived at the last act, the act which young opera-goers have never seen on stage in England. As I began it, von Karl stopped me to remind me of this. So, he said, you attack for me that great piece of dramatic music. So ist's gut. And you wondered a little time ago at the dying of grand opera on English stages. Lieber Freund, when they began to end that opera with the scene of Valentine and Raoul. I knew that opera, as opera should be, was doomed. That a true Jew's music should be so truncated to suit the sham Jews who filled the stalls and who wanted to catch their dirty trains. Lieber Herr Je! So he subsided in inarticulate wrath, and I went on playing until I came to that soul-stirring prayer of Marcel's, in which he and his companions see heaven opening to them in its glory, even amid the puny thunder and turmoil of earthly persecution. I began the first notes and stopped. Overcome by the remembrance of the extraordinary effect the scene had produced upon me when I had last heard it, in the old days, when music was the real object of the Italian opera in London. I cannot help stopping, I said, to ask you if I am right in thinking that Sponzini, the last singer of Marcel, whom I heard in that scene, was as great an artist as one could wish to hear and see. You are right, answered von Carus. He was, short of La Blache, the greatest expression of that wonderful appeal that you can imagine. The English public, then already brutalised for opera by the star and stall system, did not taste him because he was not puffed, and the uh, virtuosi, with some pedantry, refused him full recognition because, like Ronconi, he was not always sure of his intonation. But he was a great singer and a great actor. Mamma Tosi, he added, mentioning the greatest teacher and critic of singing this age has known, will tell you the same if you ask her. But, mein bester, I am glad for other reasons that you stopped to ask me that question. It makes it more easy for me to beg you not to go on with that scene. Am I wrong? I began to ask, egotism overpowering discretion, when he interrupted me with, 
In your playing, my child? No, that is well, very well for an amateur. There are other reasons. As he spoke, the look of sadness that I had often seen on his face came over it, and, what was unusual, stayed there. He sank back in his chair, thinking and puffing heavily at his pipe. I, ashamed of my impulsive question, struck one or two chords softly to prevent his or my ear from remembering discontentedly an unfinished theme, and sat opposite to him, awaiting his continued silence or his speech. I will tell you, said von Carus. The thing itself happened just about the time when first Italian opera ceased to be interpreted on English stages by Italians, when the babble collection of French tenors, Polish or German sopranos, Alsatian baritones and bassi, that odd collection of Vassi Wünschen in the way of singing nationalities that went on for so many years had first begun. Then, in the early time, it was always Signor and Signora in the bills, whatever the country of the singer. And that was at least as sensible as the silly kind of compromises they introduced afterward. This talk, von Carlos delivered, as I thought, with a somewhat exaggerated air of lightness and conscious irrelevance, and when he went on he fell into a graver tone as he said, But the beginning of the story, I am going to tell you, goes back many years further than that. It goes back, indeed, to the early days of my own youth, when I was a humble member of a small band at a small theatre in Germany. Small, I mean, in its importance, for the stage was large enough, too large, indeed, for the scanty chorus that our small state aid afforded. For the town itself, it is one of which comparatively few English opera goers have heard. You who have travelled in Germany probably know it, and therefore I shall not try to describe it exactly any more than I shall give you the real names of the parties concerned. However, continued the violinist, let me get on to the story without more forewords. It is not an enticing one to tell, and I would not tell it but to you. The first time I saw her was on a summer evening. I had walked to the theatre through the streets of the strange old-fashioned town, which always had to me such an air of unreality, with the vague reminiscences of a past royalty that hung about its operatic-looking buildings. I was tired both of the place and of my business there, and the knowledge that a first appearance was to take place that night had not roused me from my dreamy discontent. She had appeared at other towns, of no European fame, with success, and she came to our company als Gast, a rehearsal had been arranged for the morning, but she arrived late and tired after the band had been graciously excused from dancing attendance for her doubtful arrival any longer. She had gone through the mere business of her scenes with the stage manager, and of course she knew her words and music well enough to dispense in such a case with full rehearsal. Her name was, I will call her Fräulein Della Mandola, and she made her first appearance as Agatha in Der Freischütz. When she came on the stage, I was still moody and was looking at nothing but my part of the score, which, as it seemed to me, I knew already too well. But her voice, when she began to sing then, I looked up and I saw on the stage the most beautiful, the most attractive creature I have ever seen. Imagine her as you will from that description I will not attempt to describe her more closely, for her voice. You have heard Mademoiselle Gerster, I bowed assent. Well, it was a voice of that quality, and the method was not unlike. I, looking back, still think that, with all technical faults of a beginner, the freshness and charm of that representation have never been surpassed, but by this time you have guessed that I fell madly in love with the Fräulein at first sight and hearing, and therefore I am still, with that memory yet clinging to me, what you call a prejudiced witness. Von Carus leaned back again, and seemed to give himself up for a few moments to recollection, before he resumed his story. The impression she made upon me was, 
more or less, that which she produced upon the whole audience, an instructed and critical audience enough, though, as I tell you, it was not the kind of theatre where the travelling impresario of past times was likely to be on the lookout for a prodigy. But the sweetness and force of the voice, the spontaneity, as it seemed in singing and acting, the modesty, both individual and artistic, which tempered all the fire of the performance, these things made Della Mandola a favourite at once, and led to her taking an engagement of several weeks. Every time she sang, which was about twice a week, the house was full. Every time she made herself more and more admired and beloved. And every time I, wretched fiddler that I was, fell more in love with her, with a love that I never declared, that I have never even spoken of till now. What would that have profited me to speak of it? She was immeasurably out of my reach, I knew, and she was that two years or so older than myself that made it natural for her to treat me as a boy, to whom it was careless kindness to give a pleasant smile and a pleasant word when occasion offered. Besides, and believe me here, that I was not ever jealous of this with a lover's jealousy. Very soon she and our tenor for the season found out each other's good qualities and were understood by all of us in the theatre to be betrothed. It would have been a pretty match. He was half German, half Italian, and had then, at least, from his German father, some solid qualities of wisdom and judgment, which should have been valuable in their menage. Ah, he stopped again, and I was beginning to ask a question, which he answered before I had completed it in words. No, lieber Freund, he said, that was not to be. They parted at the end of the season, full of love and trust in each other. Each was going to fulfill another promising engagement, and each looked forward to their meeting on the great lyric stages of Europe, to share triumphs deserved by talent and hard work, and to match their triumphs by those of a happy marriage. They were to correspond constantly, and there was to be no black spot in their happy life. So she went to Italy, and then her dreams of extravagant success came true. She was adored wherever she went, and the London engagement came far sooner than she had expected it. He, it is a story so simple and so tragic, I can tell you it in four words, and you will know what is coming. He lost his voice. Taken with what had gone before, and especially with certain intonations and gestures of von Carus, as he had spoken, the words were tragic enough, and I guessed from them part, though not all of the sequel, which he proceeded to tell me with the rapid utterance of a man who wishes to get quickly through a painful task. His emotion caused him at times to speak in his native German, but I give his words in English throughout. I heard of this misfortune, and I heard that, when he broke the news to her, he received a letter from her full of encouragement and love, which made up as much as anything could for his grief and disappointment. Then I, too, went about to seek a better fortune as a violinist, and in my little way as a composer, and, save for news now and again of the de la Mandola's continued success, I saw and heard nothing more of them directly, until I found myself playing a violin in the orchestra of the old Her Majesty's Theatre, that delightful theatre with the amber hangings. She had sung one or two parts, in which she had completely captivated the English public, and she had met me once or twice in and out of the theatre, and had had her gracious smile and her kind words of old for me, with the same innocent caressing manner that I remembered so well. I had been told that, of late, she had put this manner and its charms to no very noble uses, and though the man who told me so was my bosom friend, it went near to being an ill thing either for him or for me that he had said it. Well, let me get on. She was to appear for the first time before an English public as Valentine in the Huguenot. There were as many rehearsals as could be managed, and I who had never seen or heard her in this great part, took, of course, a great and special interest in it. One day I met her after rehearsal, 
and in the middle of paying her compliments and offering her at her own request a hint here and there i suddenly asked her for news of eugen that was the first name of the tenor of the old days i could not guess at the moment what impulse prompted me to do this any more than i could tell why i had never asked after him in our former meetings she started and in her face it was as if first a storm of lightning and then a sudden weeping of rain had come i do not mean that she wept but that there was the rapid change from a sudden fury to a grief and sadness as sudden then she drew herself up with a dignity that made her slight form so majestic on the stage at great moments of passion and saying coldly that she could give me no news upon this subject she went to her carriage and left me feeling humiliated five minutes afterward i knew why i had asked her the question as the strange-looking crowd of chorus singers straggled out of the stage entrance my eye was caught by one figure that i had noticed vaguely at rehearsal not knowing why i noticed it at all i knew now it was eugen i did not know whether i should do well to speak to him or not but he solved the question for me he recognized me and came up to me with a hint in his gait of the old grace and dash that had made people speak of him as the one tenor who might perhaps take the place of the king of all the tenors what a raoul i thought to myself for her valentine if only his voice had lasted herr von carus he said as he came close to me you i know are not one to turn your back on an old friend because his fortunes are fallen i pressed his hand it was hot and trembling his face was pale and there was a strange look in his eyes i said to him all the things that old friendship could suggest avoiding only one subject and i persuaded him to come to breakfast with me at once feeling pretty sure that he needed physical as well as mental solace during the breakfast he resumed but with an exaggeration that could not but strike me his old gaiety of manner and told me with a humour that had something biting in it various adventures he had had since he had lost his voice and with it his hopes as we smoked after breakfast he suddenly became taciturn and the sparkle in his eyes gave place to that same fierce heavy look that had surprised me before suddenly he got up said to me i have written to her and went his way that was the only reference to her that passed between us and its effect upon me was indescribably painful the next night but one was that of her first appearance as valentine and in the intervening day i had no opportunity of speaking either to her or to him indeed he seemed to avoid me on the afternoon before her appearance i fell in with him he looked paler thinner more desperate than before this time again he sought me of his own accord and said in a tone which appeared to me terribly quiet it will be a triumph an effect that will never be forgotten and again he disappeared swiftly without giving me the chance of a reply i confess to you that i shuddered without knowing why and was ashamed of myself for doing so well it was a great triumph as scene followed scene the diva gained greater and greater feeling of her part greater and greater hold upon her audience among the musicians between the acts there was but one opinion that this was the finest valentine that the stage had seen for years in the excitement i clean forgot eugen then came that last scene sponzini of whom you spoke just now then in the fullness of his youth and power delivered the prayer like one inspired and she with voice action and expression shared the exultation that triumphs over impending death sanbris came on at the head of his detachment of king's troops and gave the fatal order del re in nome fuoco it was not seen at first it was not seen till the fall of the curtain what had happened mein lieber she was shot through the heart and among those of the king's troops also was one who was dead there was a pause no continued von carus answering my unasked question 
The shot was always attributed to accident, and for him, for Eugen, there was no doubt he had heart disease. For the man who was at the time supposed to be in close relations with her, what matters it to speak? But you do not wonder that I have strange and painful notions of the last act of the Huguenot. What a situation! exclaimed the eminent tragedian and critic simultaneously as the musical voice of the narrator ceased. The action to the word, indeed, added the former. Poor thing, said Beatrice tenderly in a low voice. To have let a thoughtless love come into her life and then to expiate it by dying with the words of a sham one on her lips. What a sad story! And she rose and gathered her wraps together and went below all the men assisting her to the head of the gangway. The following evening was starless but serene. A veil spread over the upper sky, but along the horizon lay banked up clouds behind which summer lightnings played from time to time, throwing them out into weird and spectral relief. The sea heaved in long, lazy pulsations, and the waves were picked out with gold by the lines of lambent phosphorescence along their drifting summits. The wind was just sufficient to steady the ship, making her lie over so little that she seemed almost to ride on an even keel. There was a sense of languor over everything, which would have been delightful had it not meant a beggarly account of knots in the twenty-four hours' run. Our party assembled after dinner in the lee of the smoking-room, through the windows of which sufficient light streamed forth to make figures recognisable, though it left features in the vague. "'The critic's story,' cried the novelist. "'Now,' he added, turning to the romancer, "'providence hath delivered our enemy into our hands. We are to have the satisfaction for which Job longed in vain. Our critic has written a book, or, at least, has concocted a story.' "'Not at all,' replied the critic. "'No concoction in the matter. "'It is an adventure which befell an acquaintance of mine, "'and I read it from his manuscript. "'He sent it me for my opinion, "'and I promised to try and place it in America. "'I am curious to see how it strikes you.' "'Fiat experimentum, in short,' said the romancer. I did not put it in that way, returned the critic, and, rising so as to let the lamplight fall on the bundle of manuscript in his hand, he read as follows. End of section 5. Recording by Ulrike Denis. Section 6 of The Broken Shaft, Tales in Mid-Ocean. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by TJP1421. The Broken Shaft, Tales in Mid-Ocean, Section 6, My Fascinating Friend, by William Archer. Nature has cursed me with a retiring disposition. I have gone round the world without making a single friend by the way. Coming out of my own shell, is as difficult to me as drawing others out of theirs. There are some men who go through life extracting the substance of every one they meet, as one picks out periwinkles with a pin. To me, my fellow men are oysters, and I have no oyster knife. My sole consolation, if it be one, is that my own valves absolutely defy the oyster knives of others. Not more than twice or thrice in my life have I met a fellow creature at whose open sesame the treasures of my heart and brain stood instantly revealed. My fascinating friend was one of these rare and sympathetic beings. I was lounging away a few days at Monaco, awaiting a summons to join some relations in Italy. One afternoon I had started for an aimless and rambling climb among the olive terraces on the lower slopes of the Tete du Chêne finding an exquisite coin of vantage among the roots of a gnarled old trunk springing from a built-up semicircular patch of level ground. I sat me down to rest and read and dream. Below me, a little to the right, Monaco jutted out into the purple sea. I could distinguish carriages and pedestrians coming and going on the chaise between the promontory and Monte Carlo, but I was far too high for any sound to reach me. 
Away to the left, the coast took a magnificent sweep, past the clustering houses of Roca Bruna, past the mountains at whose base Menton nestled unseen, past the Italian frontier, past the bight of Ventimiglia, to where Capo di Bordighera stood faintly outlined between the sea and sky. There was not a solitary sail on the whole expanse of the Mediterranean, a line of white curving at rhythmic intervals along a small patch of sandy beach showed that there was a gentle swell upon the sea, but its surface was mirror-like. A lovelier scene there was not in the world, and it was at its very loveliest. I took the Saturday review from my pocket and was soon immersed in an article on the commutation of tithes. I was aroused from my absorption by the rattle of a small stone hopping down the steep track half path, half stairway, by which I had ascended. It had been loosened by the foot of a descending wayfarer, in whom, as he picked his way slowly downward, I recognized a middle-aged German, that I supposed to be his nationality, who had been very assiduous at the roulette tables of the casino for some days past. There was nothing remarkable in his appearance. His spectacled eyes, squat nose, and square-cropped, bristling beard being simply characteristic of his class and country. He did not notice me as he went by, being too intent on his footing to look about him. But I was so placed that it was a minute or more before he passed out of sight round a bend in the path. He was just turning the corner, and my eyes were still fixed on him when I was conscious of another figure within my field of vision. This second comer had descended the same pathway, but had loosened no stones on his passage. He trod with such exquisite lightness and agility that he had passed close by me without my being aware of his presence. While he, for his part, had his eyes fixed with a curious intensity on the thick-set figure of the German, upon whom, at his rate of progress, he must have been gaining rapidly. A glance showed me that he was a young man of slender figure, dressed in a suit of dark-colored tweed of English cut, and wearing a light brown wide-awake hat. Just as my eye fell upon him, he put his hand into the inner breast pocket of his coat and drew from it something which, as he was now well past me, I could not see. At the same moment, some small object, probably jerked out of his pocket by mistake, fell almost noiselessly on the path at his feet. In his apparently eager haste, he did not notice his loss, but was gliding onward, leaving what I took to be his purse lying on the path. It was clearly my duty to call his attention to it. So I said, Hi! An interjection which I found serves its purpose in all countries. He gave a perceptible start and looked round at me over his shoulder. I pointed to the object he had dropped and said, Voila! He had thrust back into his pocket the thing, whatever it was, which he held in his hand, and now turned round to look where I was pointing. Ah! he said in English. My cigarette case. I am much obliged to you. And he stooped and picked it up. I thought it was your purse, I said. I would rather have lost my purse than this, he said with a light laugh. He had apparently abandoned his intention of overtaking the German, who had meanwhile passed out of sight. Are you such an enthusiastic smoker? I asked. I go in for quality, not quantity, he replied. And a Spanish friend has just given me some incomparable cigarettos. He opened the case as he ascended the few steps which brought him up to my little plateau. Have one, he said, holding it out to me with the most winning smile I have ever seen on any human face. I was about to take one from the left-hand side of the case when he turned it away and presented the other side to me. No, no, he said. These flat ones are my common brand. The round ones are the gems. I'm robbing you, I said as I took one. Not if you are smoker enough to appreciate it, he said as he stretched himself on the ground beside me, and produced from a little gold matchbox a wax vesta, with which he lighted my cigarette in his own. So graceful was his whole personality, so easy and charming his manner, that it did not strike me as in the least odd that he should thus make friends with me by the mere exchange of a half dozen words. I looked at him as he lay resting on his elbows and smoking lazily. He had thrown his hat off, and his wavy hair, longish and of an opaque charcoal black, 
fell over his temples while he shook it back behind his ears. He was a little above the middle height, of dark complexion, with large and soft black eyes and arched eyebrows, a small and rather broad nose, the worst feature in his face, full, curving, and sensitive lips, and a very strong and rounded chin. He was absolutely beardless, but a slight black down on the upper lip announced a coming mustache. His age could not have been more than twenty. The cut of his clothes, as I have said, was English, but his large black satin neckcloth flowing out over the collar of his coat was such as no home-keeping Englishman would ever have dared to appear in. This detail, combined with his accent, perfectly pure but a trifle precise and deliberate, let me take him for an Englishman brought up on the continent, probably in Italy, for there was no French intonation in his speech. His voice was rich, but not deep, a light baritone. He took up my Saturday review. The Bible of the Englishmen abroad, he said, one of the institutions that make me proud of our country. I have it sent to me every week, I said. So my father, he replied, he used to say, Shakespeare we share with the Americans, but damn it, the Saturday review is all our own. He was one of the old school, my father. And the good school, I said with enthusiasm. So am I. Now, I'm a bit of a radical, my new friend rejoined, looking up with a smile, which made the confession charming rather than objectionable, and from this point we started upon a discussion, every word of which I could write down if I chose, such a lasting impression did it make upon me. He was indeed a brilliant talker, having read much and traveled enormously for one so young. I think I've lived in every country in Europe, he said, except Russia. Somehow it has never interested me. I found that he was a Cambridge man, or at least was intimately acquainted with Cambridge life and thought, and this was another bond between us. His radicalism was not very formidable. It amounted to little more, indeed, than a turn for humorous paradox. Our discussion reminded me of Fuller's description of the wit combats between Ben Jonson and Shakespeare at the Mermaid. I was the Spanish galleon. My fascinating friend was the English man of war, ready to take advantage of all winds by the quickness of his wit and invention. An hour sped away delightfully, the only thing I did not greatly enjoy being the cigarette, which seemed to me no better than many I had smoked before. "'What do you think of my cigarettes?' he said as I threw away the stump. I felt that a blunt expression of opinion would be in bad taste after his generosity and offering an utter stranger the best he had. Exquisite, I answered. I thought you would say so, he replied gravely. Have another. Let me try one of your common ones, I said. No, you shan't, he replied, closing the case with a sudden snap, which endangered my fingers, but softened the brusquerie of the proceeding by one of his enthralling smiles. Then he added, using one of the odd idioms which gave his speech a peculiar piquancy, I don't palm off upon my friends what I have of second best. He reopened the case and held it out to me. To have refused would have been to confess that I did not appreciate his gems, as he called them. I smoked another, in which I still failed to find any unusual fragrance, but the aroma of my new-found friend's whole personality was so keen and subtle that it may have deadened my nerves to any more material sensation. We lay talking until the pink flush of evening spread along the horizon, and in it Corsica, invisible before, seemed to body itself forth from nothingness, like an island of phantom peaks and headlands. Then we rose, and, in the quickly gathering dusk, took our way down among the olive yards and through the orange gardens to Monte Carlo. My acquaintance with my fascinating friend lasted little more than forty-eight hours, but during that time we were inseparable. He was not at my hotel, but on that first evening I persuaded him to dine with me, and soon after breakfast on the following morning I went in search of him. I was at the Russe, he at the Hotel de Paris. I found him smoking on the veranda, and at a table not far distant sat the German of the previous afternoon, finishing a tolerably copious déjeuner à la fourchette. As soon as he had scraped his plate quite clean and finished the last dregs of his bottle of wine, 
he rose and took his way to the casino after a few minutes talk with my fascinating friend i suggested a stroll over to monaco he agreed and we spent the whole day together loitering and lounging talking and dreaming we went to the casino in the afternoon to hear the concert and i discovered my friend to be a cultivated musician then we strolled into the gambling room for an hour but neither of us played the german was busy at one of the roulette tables and seemed to be winning considerably that evening i dined with my friend at the table d'hote of his hotel at the other end of the table i could see the german sitting silent and unnoticing wrapped in the joys of deglutition next morning by arrangement my friend called upon me at my hotel and over one of his cigarettes to which i was getting accustomed we discussed our plan for the day i suggested a wider flight than yesterday's had he ever been to eza the old saracen robber's nest perched on a rock a thousand feet above the sea halfway between monaco and villa franca no he had not been there and after some consideration he agreed to accompany me we went by rail to the little station on the seashore and then attacked the arduous ascent the day was perfect though rather too warm for climbing and we had frequent rests among the olive trees with delightfully discursive talks and all things under the sun my companion's charm grew upon me moment by moment there was in his manner a sort of refined coquetry of amiability which i found irresistible it was combined with a frankness of sympathy and interest subtly flattering to a man of my unsocial habit of mind i was conscious every now and then that he was drawing me out but to be drawn out so gently and genially was to me a novel and delightful experience it produced in me one of those effusions of communicativeness to which i am told all reticent people are occasionally subject i have myself given way to them some three or four times in my life and found myself pouring forth the perfect strangers such intimate details of feeling and experience as i would rather die than impart to my dearest friend three or four times i say i have found myself suddenly and inexplicably brought within the influence of some invisible truth-compelling talisman which drew from me confessions the rack could not have extorted but never has the influence been so irresistible as in the case of my fascinating friend i told him what i had told to no other human soul what i had told to the lonely glacier to the lord storm cloud to the seething sea but had never breathed in mortal ear i told him the tragedy of my life how well i remember the scene we were resting beneath the chestnut trees that shadow of stretch of level sward immediately below the last short stage of ascent that leads into the heart of the squalid village now resting in the crevices of the old moslem fastness the midday hush was on sea and sky Far out on the horizon, a level line of smoke showed where an unseen steamer was crawling along under the edge of the sapphire sphere. As I reached the climax of my tale, an old woman, bent almost double beneath a huge faggot of firewood, passed on her way to the village. I remember that it crossed my mind to wonder whether there was any capacity in the nature of such as she for suffering at all comparable to that which I was describing. My companion's sympathy was subtle and soothing there was in my tale an element of the grotesque which might have tempted a vulgar nature to flippancy no smile crossed my companion's lips he turned away his head on pretense of watching the receding figure of the old peasant woman when he looked at me again his deep dark eyes were suffused with a moisture which enhanced the mystery of their tenderness in that moment I felt, as I had never felt before, what it is to find a friend. We returned to Monte Carlo late in the afternoon, and I found a telegram at my hotel begging me to be in Genoa the following morning. I had barely time to bundle my traps together and swallow a hasty meal before my train was due. I scrawled a note to my new-found confidant, expressing most sincerely my sorrow at parting from him so soon and so suddenly, and my hope that ere long we should meet again. The train was already at the platform when I reached the station. There were one or two first-class through carriages on it, which, for a French railway, were unusually empty. In one of them I saw at the window the head of the German, and from a certain subdued radiance in his expression I judged that he must be carrying off a considerable pile from the gaming table. 
His personality was not of the most attractive, and there was something in his squat nose suggestive of stertorous possibilities, which, under ordinary circumstances, would have held me aloof from him. But, shall I confess it? He had for me a certain sentimental attraction, because he was associated in my mind with that first meeting with my forty-eight hours friend. I looked into his compartment. An overcoat and valise lay in the opposite corner from his, showing that seat to be engaged, but two corners were still left me to choose from. I installed myself in one of them, face to face with the valise and overcoat, and awaited the signal to start. The cry, En voiture, messieurs, soon came, and a lithe figure sprang into the carriage. It was my fascinating friend. For a single moment, I thought that a flash of annoyance crossed his features on finding me there, but the impression vanished at once, for his greeting was as full of cordiality as of surprise. We soon exchanged explanations. He, like myself, had been called away by telegram, not to Genoa, but to Rome. He, like myself, had left a note expressing his heartfelt regret at our sudden separation. As we sped along, skirting bays that shone burnished in the evening light, and rumbling every now and then through a tunnel-pierced promontory, we resumed the almost affectionate converse interrupted only an hour before, and I found him a more delightful companion than ever. His exquisitely playful fantasy seemed to be acting at high pressure, as in the case of a man who is talking to pass the time under the stimulus of a delightful anticipation. I suspected that he was hurrying to some peculiarly agreeable rendezvous in Rome, and I hinted my suspicion, which he laughed off in such a way as to confirm it. The German, in the meantime, sat stolid and unmoved, making some penciled calculations in a little pocket book. He clearly did not understand English. As we approached Ventimiglia, my friend rose, took down his valise from the rack, and, turning his back to me, made some changes in its arrangement, which I, of course, did not see. He then locked it carefully and kept it beside him. At Ventimiglia we had all to turn out to undergo the inspection of the Italian Dogana. My friend's valise was his sole luggage, and I noticed rather to my surprise that he gave the custom house official a very large bribe, two or three gold pieces, to make his inspection of it purely nominal, and forgo the opening of either of the inside compartments. The German, on the other hand, had a small portmanteau and a large dispatch box, both of which he had opened with a certain ostentation, and I observed that the official's eyes glittered under his raised eyebrows as he looked into the contents of the dispatch box. On returning to the train, we all three resumed our old places, and the German drew the shade of a sleeping cap over his eyes and settled himself down for the night. It was now quite dark, but the moon was shining. Have you a large supply of the gems in your valise? I asked, smiling curious to know his reason for a subterfuge which accorded ill with his ordinary straightforwardness, and remembering that tobacco is absolutely prohibited at the Italian frontier. Unfortunately, no, he said. My gems are all gone, and I have only my common cigarettes remaining. Will you try them, such as they are? And he held out his case, both sides of which were now filled with the flat cigarettes. We each took one and lighted it, but he began giving me an account of a meeting he had had with Lord Beaconsfield, which he detailed so fully and with so much enthusiasm that, after a whiff or two, he allowed his cigarette to go out. I could not understand his taste in tobacco. These cigarettes, which he despised, seemed to me at once more delicate and more peculiar than the others. They had a flavor which was quite unknown to me. I was much interested in his vivid account of the personality of that great man, whom I admired then while he was yet with us, and whom, as a knight of the Primrose League, I now revere. But our climb of the morning and the scrambling departure of the afternoon were beginning to tell on me, and I became irresistibly drowsy. Gradually, and in spite of myself, my eyes closed. I could still hear my companion's voice mingling with the heavy breathing of the German, who had been asleep for some time. But soon, even these sounds ceased to penetrate the mist of languor. The end of my cigarette dropped from between my fingers, and I knew no more. My awakening was slow and spasmodic, 
there was a clearly perceptible interval, probably several minutes, between the first stirrings of consciousness and the full clarification of my faculties. I began to be aware of the rumble and oscillation of the train without realizing what was meant. Then I opened my eyes and blinked at the lamp, and vaguely noted the yellow oil washing to and fro in the bowl. Then the white square of the avis au voyageur caught my eye in the gloom under the luggage rack, and beneath it, on the seat, I saw the light reflected from the lock of the German's portmanteau. Next I was conscious of the German himself still sleeping in his corner, but no longer puffing and grunting as when I had fallen asleep. Then I raised my head, looked round the carriage, and the next moment sprang bolt upright in dismay. Where was my fascinating friend? Gone, vanished, there was not a trace of him. His valise, his great coat, all had disappeared. Only in the little cigar ash box on the window frame I saw the flat cigarette which he had barely lighted. How long before? I looked at my watch. It must have been about an hour and a half ago. By this time I had all my faculties about me. I looked across at the German, intending to ask him if he knew anything of our late traveling companion. Then I noticed that his head had fallen forward in such a way that it seemed to me suffocation must be imminent. I approached him, and I put down my head to look into his face. As I did so, I saw a roundish black object on the oilcloth floor not far from the toe of his boot. The lamplight was reflected at a single point from its convex surface. I put my hand down and touched it. It was liquid. I looked at my fingers. They were not black, but red. I think, but I am not sure, that I screamed aloud. I shrank to the other end of the carriage, and it was some moments before I had sufficient presence of mind to look for a means of communicating with the guard. Of course there was none. I was alone for an indefinite time with a dead man. But was he dead? I had little doubt, from the way his head hung, that his throat was cut, and a horrible fascination drew me to his side to examine. No, there was no sign of the hideous fissure I expected to find beneath the grey bristles of his beard. His head fell forward again into the same position, and I saw with horror that I had left two bloody finger marks upon the grey shade of his sleeping cap. Then I noticed for the first time that the window he was facing stood open, for a gust of wind came through it and blew back the lapel of his coat. What was that on his waistcoat? I tore the coat back and examined. It was a small triangular hole just over the heart, and round it there was a dark circle about the size of a shilling where the blood had soaked through the light material. In examining it, I did what the murderer had not done, disturbed the equilibrium of the body which fell over against me. At that moment, I heard a loud voice behind me, coming from I knew not where. I nearly fainted with terror. The train was still going at full speed. The compartment was empty, save for myself and the ghastly object which lay in my arms, and yet I seemed to hear a voice almost at my ear. There it was again. I summoned my courage to look round. It was the guard of the train clinging on outside the window and demanding, Bulagletti! By this time he too saw that something was amiss. He opened the door and swung himself into the carriage. Dio mio, I heard him exclaim as I actually flung myself into his arms and pointed to the body now lying in a huddled heap amid its own blood on the floor. Then, for the first time in my life, I positively swooned away and knew no more. When I came to myself, the train had stopped at a small station, the name of which I do not know to this day. There was a babble of speech going on around not one word of which I could understand. I was on the platform, supported between two men in uniform, with cocked hats and cockades. In vain I tried to tell my story. I knew little or no Italian, and though there were one or two Frenchmen in the train, they were useless as interpreters, for on the one hand my power of speaking French seemed to have departed in my agitation, and on the other hand none of the Italians understood it. In vain I tried to make them understand that a Giovanni had travelled in the compartment with us, who had now disappeared. The Italian guard, who had come on at Ventimiglia, evidently had no recollection of him. He merely shook his head, said, No capisco, and inquired if I was Prussiano. The train had already been delayed some time, and, 
after a consultation between the station master the guard and the syndic of the village who had been summoned in haste it was determined to hand the matter over to the authorities at genoa the two carabinieri sat on each side of me facing the engine and on the opposite seat the body was stretched out with a luggage tarpaulin over it in this hideous fashion i passed the four or five remaining hours of the journey to genoa the next week i spent in an italian prison a very uncomfortable yet quite unromantic place of abode fortunately my friends were by this time in genoa and they succeeded in obtaining some slight mitigation of my discomforts at the end of that time i was released there being no evidence against me the testimony of the french guard of the booking clerk at monaco and of the staff at the hotel de paris established the existence of my fascinating friend which was at first called in question but no trace could be found of him with him had disappeared his victim's dispatch box in which were stored the proceeds of several days of successful gambling robbery however did not seem to have been the primary motive of the crime for his watch purse and the heavy jewelry about his person were all untouched from the german consul at genoa i learned privately after my release that the murdered man though in fact a prussian had lived long in russia and was suspected of having an unofficial connection with the st petersburg police it was thought indeed that the capital with which he had commenced his operation at monte carlo was the reward of some special act of treachery so that the anarchists if it was indeed they who struck the blow had merely suffered judas to put his thirty pieces out to usance in order to pay back to their enemies with interest the blood money of their friends about two years later i happened one day to make an afternoon call in mayfair at the house of a lady well known in the social and political world who honors me if i may say so with her friendship her drawing-room was crowded and the cheerful ring of afternoon teacups was audible through the pleasant medley of women's voices i joined a group around the hostess where an animated discussion was in progress on the irish coercion bill then the leading political topic of the day the argument interested me deeply but it is one of my mental peculiarities that when several conversations are going on around me i can by no means keep my attention exclusively fixed upon the one in which i am myself engaged odds and ends from all the others find their way into my ears and my consciousness and i am sometimes accused of absence of mind when my fault is in reality a too great alertness of the sense of hearing in this instance the conversation of three or four groups was more or less audible to me but it was not long before my attention was absorbed by the voice of a lady seated at the other side of the circular ottoman on which i myself had taken my place she was talking merrily and her hearers in one of whom as i glanced over my shoulder i recognized an ex-cabinet minister seemed to be greatly entertained as her back was toward me all i could see of the lady herself was her short black hair falling over the handsome fur collar of her mantle he was so tragic about it she was saying that it was really impayable the lady was beautiful wealthy accomplished and i don't know what else the rival was an australian squatter with a beard as thick as his native bush my communicative friend i scarcely knew even his name when he poured forth his woes to me thought that he had an advantage in his light mustache with a military twirl in it they were all three traveling in switzerland but the australian had gone off to make the ascent of some peak or other leaving the field to the foe for a couple days at least on the first day the foe made the most of his time and had nearly brought matters to a crisis the next morning he had got himself up as exquisitely as possible in order to clinch his conquest but found to his disgust that he had left his dressing case with his razors at the last stopping place there was nothing for it but to try the village barber who was also the village stationer and draper and ironmonger and chemist a sort of alpine whitley in fact his face had just been soaped what do you call it lathered is it not and the barber had actually taken hold of his nose so as to get his head into the right position when in the mirror opposite he saw the door open and oh horror who should walk into the shop but the fair one herself he gave such a start that the barber gashed his chin his eyes met hers in the mirror for a moment he saw her lips quiver and tremble 
and then she burst into shrieks of uncontrollable laughter and rushed out of the shop. If you knew the pompous little man, I'm sure you would sympathize with her. I know I did when he told me the story. His heart sank within him, but he acted like a Briton. He determined to take no notice of the contretemps, but returned boldly to the attack. She received him demurely at first, but the moment she raised her eyes to his face and saw the patch of sticking plaster on his chin, she was again seized with such convulsions that she had to rush from the room. She is now in Melbourne, he said almost with a sob, and I assure you, my dear friend, that I never now touch a razor without an impulse to which I expect I shall one day succumb to put it to a desperate use. There was a singing in my ears, and my brain was whirling. This story, heartlessly and irreverently told, was the tragedy of my life. I had breathed it to no human soul, save one. I rose from my seat, wondering within myself whether my agitation was visible to those around me, and went over to the other side of the room, whence I could obtain a view of the speaker. There were the deep, dark eyes, there were the full, sensuous lips, the upper shaded with an impalpable down. There was the charcoal black hair. I knew too well that rich contralto voice. It was my fascinating friend. Before I had fully realized the situation, she rose, handed her empty teacup to the cabinet minister, bowed to him and his companion, and made her way up to the hostess, evidently intending to take her leave. As she turned away, after shaking hands cordially with Lady X, her eyes met mine intently fixed upon her. She did not start. She neither flushed nor turned pale. She simply raised for an instant her finely arched eyebrows, and as her tall figure sailed past me out of the room, she turned upon me the same exquisite and irresistible smile with which my fascinating friend had offered me his cigarette case that evening among the olive trees. I hurried up to Lady X. Who is the lady who has just left the room? I asked. Oh, that is the Baroness M., she replied. She is half an Englishwoman, half a Pole. She was my daughter's bosom friend at Girton, a most interesting girl. Is she a politician? I asked. No, that's the one thing I don't like about her. She is not a bit of a patriot. She makes a joke of her country's wrongs and sufferings. Should you like to meet her? Dine with us the day after tomorrow. She's to be here. I dined with Lady X on the appointed day, but the Baroness was not there. Urgent family affairs had called her suddenly to Poland. A week later, the assassination of the Tsar sent a thrill of horror through the civilized world. Don't you think your friend might be held an accessory after the fact to the death of the German? asked the novelist, when all the flattering comments, which were many, were at an end. And an accessory before the fact to the assassination of the Tsar? chimed in the editor. Why didn't he go straight from Lady X's house to the nearest police station and put the police on the track of his fascinating friend? What a question, the romancer exclaimed, starting from his seat and pacing restlessly about the deck. How could any man with a palate for the rarest flavors of life resist the temptation of taking that woman down to dinner? And besides, hadn't he eaten salt with her? Hadn't he smoked the social cigarette with her? Shade of De Quincey, are we to treat like a vulgar criminal a mistress of the finest of the fine arts? Shall we be such crawling creatures as to seek to lay by the heels a muse of murder? Are we a generation of detectives that we should do this thing? So my friend put it to me, said the critic dryly. Not quite so eloquently, but to that effect. Between ourselves, though, I believe he was influenced more by considerations of his personal safety than the admiration for murder as a fine art. He remembered the fate of the German and was unwilling to share it. He adopted a policy of non-intervention, said the eminent tragedian, who in his hours of leisure was something of a politician. I should rather say of laissez-faire, or more precisely of laissez-assassinaire laughed the editor. What was the fascinating friend supposed to have in her portmanteau? asked Beatrice. What was she so anxious to conceal from the customs officers? Her woman's clothes, I imagine, the critic replied, though I don't hold myself bound to explain all the ins and outs of her proceedings. 
Then she was a wonderful woman, replied the fair questioner, as one having authority. If she could get a respectable gown and fixings, as the Americans say, into a small portmanteau. But, she added, I was very soon suspect she was a woman. Why? asked several voices simultaneously. Why, because she drew him out so easily, was the reply. You think, in fact, said the romancer, that however little its victim was aware of it, there was a touch of ewig weib linker in her fascination? Precisely. The next day was cold on deck, with a wind and drizzle from the north, but toward evening the party, who now sought each other out, who clung together like magnetic particles, gathered slowly round the warm base of the smokestack, and each one looked at each other with an inquiring eye. Among them was a quiet man of about thirty-five, with a yellow moustache and goatee, over whose right ear was always hooked the cord of a pair of powerful eyeglasses. For several days past a steady stream of fun had emanated from him, and now he was keeping every one in laughter, by a never-ending series of quaint remarks upon the ship, the passengers, and whatever came within the range of his past name. The eminent tragedian listened for some time in amused silence, and then whispered a question in the ear of the dark fellow in the yellow ulster, who stood next to him. "'Yes, indeed,' replied the latter promptly, whereupon the eminent tragedian turned to the quiet man and invited him, in the name of the company, to entertain them with whatever fiction he might have in his head. "'I have no fiction, unfortunately,' replied the man with the eyeglasses, but if a bit of sober fact of a political historical nature will please you, I am at your service. The company glanced at him with some anxiety, but his face reassured them, so their invitation had no uncertain ring about it, and the quiet man proceeded forthwith to tell of another like himself. End of section 6 Recording by TJP 1421《Section 7 of The Broken Shaft》Tales in Mid Ocean. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Coogan, San Diego. The Broken Shaft Tales in Mid Ocean. Edited by Henry Norman. Riley, M.P. by Teague Hopkins. 1. This is the story of a quiet man called Riley, who went down to a borough which nobody else had heard of, and told the people that if they would send him to Parliament, he would get them three acres and a cow apiece, and see that the country was governed by the light of common sense. They were a slow, pious people, who had no education to speak of, and as they had never listened to anything like this before, they asked old Mr. Deemster, who was standing by, applauding with both feet, what it meant. He said it was radicalism, and a good thing, too. He said, besides, now, you all want three acres and a cow, don't you? If there's any man here who doesn't, let him go home. The electors wagged their chaps like one man, but none of them went home. Very well, continued old Mr. Deemster, mounting the barrel so as to emphasize his words. You all want three acres and a cow, which comes to this, that you've been radicals all your lives without knowing it. More shame for you, then, I say, to keep on electing that there Sir Supine Lumpkin, who has never promised you anything, and wouldn't give it to you if he did. The electors felt drawn toward Riley from that moment, and twenty-six of them formed themselves into a committee, as Deemster told them to, and hired a room at the public, and sat round a table with some beer in the middle, and thought it out quietly. The more they thought it out, the better they liked it, and the less quiet they became. And when the landlord, with a face like a beetroot, came in and asked if they meant to go home that night, or didn't they, they helped one another to their legs and hiccuped three Rileys and an acre, and their wives put them to bed with the first broomstick they laid hold of. I can tell you these were strange goings-on for Polboro, and you would like to know where it came about that the people were deciding to elect Riley, whom none of them had ever seen or heard of till that night, and turn out old Sir Supine Lumpkin, the squire, who had lived among them all his life, and drawn his money out of the land, and spent it for the good of himself and his family. This Mr. Deemster was at the bottom of it all, as I dare say you expected he would be, and as far as that goes he was generally at the bottom of everything out of which he could make a trifle for himself. He was a large, bald-headed man, but over and above that he was a pill merchant, 
and had made a lot of money by mixing patent pills on a large scale. I mean, of course, that the business was on a large scale, not the pills. For you could buy them in boxes of all sizes and upward, according to the number you preferred to take once. The pills were good for one thing or another, so Deemster said, and Deemster was good for a hundred thousand, so people said. I can tell you these were strange goings-on for poor Beau, and you would like to know how it came about that the people were deciding to elect Riley, whom none of them had ever seen or heard of till that night, and turn out uh, Sir Supine Lumpkin, the squire, who had lived among them all his life and drawn his money out of the land, and spent it for the good of himself and his family. This Mr. Deemster was at the bottom of it all, as I dare say you expected he would be, and as far as that goes, he was generally at the bottom of everything out of which he could make a trifle for himself. He was a large, bald-headed man, but over and above that he was a pill merchant, and he had made a lot of money by mixing patent pills on a large scale. I mean, of course, that the business was on a large scale, not the pills. For you could buy them in boxes of all sizes and upward, according to the number you preferred to take at once. The pills were good for one thing or another, so Deemster said, and Deemster was good for a hundred thousand, so the people said. For all this, he was a frugal man, and might have been seen in his drawing-room window on fine evenings, mending his trousers with a needle and thread, because he had a saying that a stitch in time saved trousers which might otherwise have gone to the bad. He had no more than the average modesty of some others I could name who have made fortunes by hocusing the population, and he held a poor opinion of people who had not got their money out of pills or some other trade which had obliged them at one time to stand behind a counter with their sleeves rolled up and tell customers that the smallest orders were attended to as carefully as the largest. Now old Sir Supine had never made any money at all, but had had it made for him by his ancestors, so you can suppose Deemster had a very poor opinion of him. In fact, Deemster would not have cared if Sir Supine had been expropriated, and his lands made over to him, so that he could have built pill factories all over the estate. As for Sir Supine, he despised Deemster, because he had once taken a box of his pills before bedtime and refused to pay for them on the ground that they did him no good. He lived in some style at the hall with his housekeeper and his son Augustus, and people who owed him rent went round by the back door and thought themselves lucky if they did not leave some parts of their clothes with the dog. In the good old days, when men tippled and the church was in no danger, poor Borrell returned four members to Parliament and Sir Supine used to send down on the morning of the election the names of the persons to be elected. The votes of the electors were divided evenly between these gentlemen, or they would have been if most of them had not plumped for Sir Supine to show that they knew on which side their bread was buttered. The feud between Deemster and Sir Supine on account of the pills was of long standing, but it had lately been embittered by the squire's refusal to sell Deemster three roods of bogland, which he wanted to reclaim for the purposes of a vegetable garden. Deemster accordingly began to think the time had come when Pulborough needed a more generous representative in Parliament, and, casting about for a likely candidate, he heard of Riley, a quiet man who wanted to get into Parliament that he might mingle with patriots and use the privilege of a legislature to escape payment of his debts. So he invited Riley to contest Pulborough in the radical interest, and Riley who never declined an invitation, came and contested it. He went twice to chapel on Sundays, and Deemster put something in the plate for him, and on weekdays he visited the electors in their cottages and knocked his head against the wet clothes hanging from the ceiling and said he didn't mind it. Conduct like this was certain to impress a simple borough like poor borough, and the, the electors said Riley was just the man they wanted. They wondered they had never thought of him before. His cause was indirectly furthered by the indiscreet conduct of Sir Supine's son, Augustus, who carried on as if he had only a nominal respect for his own and his family's name. In Probo they had a very well-founded belief in a future place of torment for people who did not attend chapel, and you can understand with what a righteous hatred they would hate a pleasant fellow like Augustus, who always had terriers at his heels and drove a tandem of donkeys during church hours on Sunday. 
They wanted Augustus to go to chapel, like the rest of them, for his soul's good, and they thought Sir Supine would send him there if the family seat in Parliament were threatened. This is why they placarded the town with bills in favor of Riley and the three cows, and gave the editor of the radical paper some sherry to write leaders about the necessity of government by common sense. Sir Supine heard about Riley and his three cows, but took no notice further than to instruct his tenants through the high-minded Tory agent that he thought of doubling the rents at Michaelmas. However, they all of them plumped for Riley, who was elected amid a storm of cheers and rotten eggs. The real truth respecting this election is that, if any earnest politician in Polborough was sober that night, it was not Riley's fault, for he had said from the first that he would have no bribery, and any one who liked to call for something to drink in his name might do so at every public in the town. Deemster was very well pleased with himself when the result was made known, and so was Riley, and so were the electors who carried him round the town on a plank, face downward, while the disappointed Tories followed howling and hit him with their umbrellas, for it was raining. But he was just able to call for brandy when he got to his hotel, and he revived when Deemster brought his daughter Dorothy round to congratulate him on his triumph. Don't run away with the notion that Deemster cared anything about Riley or his triumph, for he didn't but he was pleased in his large-hearted way to have been one too many for the squire. Dorothy, however, a pretty and modest girl, not at all like her father, was really in sympathy f with f people, and delighted to think that they were going to have a farm apiece and cows and sheep to stock them. And as for Riley, who was going to get them these by his own unaided efforts, she thought him a hero and told him so in guarded language. Riley was delighted at this, for he was in love with Dorothy for the sake of her father's extensive business, and when old Deemster had gone out to propose that the electors should chair him, too, he took the girl's hand, and said that he had loved her ever since he had observed her frugal ways in the house, and her willingness to help her father more largely than herself, and this was the meaning he had intended to convey in every speech he had made. "'And was this the meaning you intended to convey "'when you proposed to have government by the light of common sense?' asked Dorothy. "'Yes,' answered Riley, "'for I think that is the way a man should strive to govern his wife, "'and I am glad you are such a sensible girl "'and willing to be the wife of a man who likes peace and quiet "'and who will have a good fortune with your father makes a handsome settlement.' "'She said if he really meant marriage, she would take time to think about it, "'and he must please not squeeze her hand at present.' He seemed to like her answer, and the same night he returned to his lodgings in Kennington Road, London, southwest, very well satisfied with the turn matters had taken. Sir Supine accused his son Augustus of having lost him the election, and if you had heard the elder man expostulating with the younger in the drawing-room that evening, you would have thought the atmosphere was warm enough without the parlour-maid needing to light so many gas-burners. Augustus consoled his parent by telling him that, if any justice were still sold, something would certainly be done to a man like Riley for deceiving the population. Sir Supine said that in a matter like this money was no object, that Riley must be mended or ended, and that Augustus had better go to town and find out what he could about him and how much it would cost to have him interfered with. Augustus then went to London with this end in view and took steps to let the tenants know that he disapproved of their independent conduct. He laid hands on all stray beasts and others, and put them into the pound. He stopped all paths on his estate. He enclosed all the commons. He set up stocks at every turning, and put into them any one found wandering after daybreak. He sent the rents up fifty per cent. He gave everybody notice to quit. He pulled down the signpost at the crossroads, and fined short-sighted persons half a crown if they could not say which way it ought to be set up again. He imprisoned poachers in an outhouse, and tortured them every morning in the following diabolical manner. He had all the magic arts at his fingers' ends, and with the help of the devil he had constructed an infernal machine like an armchair, which, as often as the untruth was uttered in its presence, closed automatically on whomsoever was sitting in it. He fixed the poachers here, and read them the speeches of popular politicians, and at every third sentence the machine closed on the victim and squeezed him until he howled again and again. The people began to see they had done wrong in sending Riley to Parliament. Riley, meanwhile, had joined the other patriots in the House of Commons and was feeling about like the rest of them for a chance to do something for himself. He made a good start by rising in his place one night and asking the Tory Prime Minister if he had anything to do with some fraud on a savings bank. 
This succeeded in drawing to him the favorable attention of prominent reformers, one of whom sent him an invitation to dinner. Riley now saw that he was destined to rise, and noting down in his pocket-book all the distinguished Tories who might be insulted with impunity, he reckoned that he could secure an invitation for each of them if he would save his dinner money for the rest of the session. Gus was now in town reading the police reports and going every night to the theater to find out what he could about Riley. While searching in this way, he remembered a friend called Anger, who lunched at the Athenaeum, where they known everything. He went to Anger, who was sitting in the window with some cutlets and claret before him, and when Anger saw Gus, he put his head through the window and shouted, "'Hi, Lo, come have some cutlets. How's Riley?' For they had all heard about Riley and his unusual proposals. Gus explained that he hated Riley, and asked Anger if he knew anything that would put the man in prison. Anger, who was one of the most superior men in the country, said that he had heard Riley spoken of as a serious politician of an independent turn of mind, and just the sort of person to represent a borough like Polborough, which had never been promised anything before. Of course, this was not at all what Gus wanted to hear, so he finished Anger's claret and went off in a dudgeon. "'Go to Granger of the Guards!' screamed Anger as Gus went down the steps. "'He knows everybody.' The difference between the Athenaeum and the guards is that at the Athenaeum they know everything, and in the guards they know everybody. Granger was just taking his horse into the park, for he was anxious to ride well in case of a war in foreign parts. Hello, said Granger. What have you done with Riley? For they had all heard about Riley and his singular proposals. Confound Riley, exclaimed Gus. I want to spoil him. Do you know anything about him? Granger knew everybody, but he did not know Riley which was just what Gus wanted, for it showed him that Riley could be nobody. "'Go to Ranger in the house,' said Granger. "'He's your man. He'll spoil Riley for you.' Gus thereupon took a cab and drove the nearest way to Ranger, who was on his legs in the house, proposing to tax walnuts. As soon as they had rejected his motion, he went round to the lobby to see Gus. "'Ha!' said Ranger. "'There you are. Riley's inside. Come and look at him. I was introduced to him yesterday, and he proposed I should give him a dinner.' He's the funniest dog. He has secured a night next week for a motion asking to have the government by the light of common sense. Isn't it fun? He says that when he's carried his motion, he's going to marry a girl called Dorothy, daughter to a bald-headed man who has made a fortune by selling quack pills. How's your father? Now who is this Riley, said Gus, when he had strongly stated his reasons for disliking him, the chief being that Riley proposed to marry Dorothy, whom Gus loved for her own sake. What? exclaimed Ranger. You don't know Riley, though he says you all plumped for him and chaired him on the, a plank. I'll tell you who he is. Can you speak any foreign language? Gus shook his head. Well, then, uh, I must tell you in English, but turn your head the other way. Riley? Augustus turned pale. Impossible, he said. How can it be all that in himself? But he is, answered Ranger. Chairman, committee members, honorary secretary and all. He lives by nervous politicians who, but are afraid, will tell lies about them, uh, evening newspapers. This, said Gus, is terrible, and you say you have not told me all. Neither have I told all. There is my poor old father, and he went on to draw a painful picture of the brave, high-minded old squire, rejected by his constituents and supporting himself on strong language, uh, scarcely a pleasure left in him in life except the goat. He has lost his rest, sobbed Gus. For the only place he could ever sleep quietly was in the House of Commons. And if you come to services to the party, he went on, why Papa never opened his mouth the whole time he sat there and voted against every measure brought in by the other side. If he isn't a fit person to represent the constituency like ours, please tell me who is. Don't cry, said the kind-hearted ranger. Your father shall sit here again, within a month from today. I have told you that Riley who is so unprincipled that he would borrow money from the Speaker this very night, if he could, has secured a night next week for his motion to overthrow the country. Now listen to me, and Ranger went on to unfold a plot so dark and dreadful in its details that unless I felt sure you were sitting near some whiskey, I should not like to repeat it to you. Augustus was a man of unusually strong nerve, but he trembled from head to foot. "'We shall want her help, you know,' said Ranger, jerking his finger in the direction where Dorothy was sitting in her father's drawing-room, sewing grey petticoats with red bands to them for old women in the town who had put their work-baskets in pawn. 
I am certain she will help, replied Gus, for she has often told me she would like to do something for the good of the country. That will do, said Ranger. You can leave the rest to me. Gus went away full of gratitude. He returned home by the night train and reached Purbo the next morning as the milkmen were going out with their cans to the pump. 3. He had some breakfast at the inn where his principal account was, and the waiter was obsequious. So was the landlord, and so was the girl at the bar when he went to pay her his respects, and so were the four foolish farmers who she was serving with new ale. Gus had never known anything like it, for most of these people had been bitten by his dogs at one time or another, and they generally frowned on him. But persons whom he met as he walked through the town were quite as obsequious, and even stoutish shopkeepers climbed over their counters to be in time to pull their topknots when Gus went by. The poor fellow felt quite nervous and went along swearing in a minor key, thinking they wanted to make game of him. The truth is, however, there had been a reaction. The people were melancholy and embarrassed by reason of the horrible fright the squire had thrown them into, for he had been making things so hot for them all around that they knew he felt his rejection deeply, and they asked themselves if they had treated him as he deserved, seeing that times were bad and they were backward with the rent. Squire's men had been among them, talking in a plain conservative way about the truth of things and their dependence on the family of Lumpkin, and when he went on to say that the squire meant to pull down Porborough at Michaelmas and build shooting boxes for the Tory party, who were coming to stay with him in the autumn, they began to see clearly how selfishly they had acted. As for the three acres and a cow, pursued the agent in his smooth, genial way, the squire thinks you would all be better off in America than here. It's a free country, that is, and if you supported the whiskey shops liberally, as you'd be certain to do, you might all be president some day. And all the land hereabouts belongs to the squire, as you know, and next year he means to plant cucumbers within a four-mile radius of the hall. As for the government by the light of common sense, said the agent on another day, the squire thinks you might like China better than America, for if you get in trouble there, you can have your heads cut off without the expense of a trial, and I should like to know who ever heard of a government by the light of common sense. No cabinets have ever tried it here, and if they did, do you suppose the country would stand it? You have been bamboozled by a wicked radical, and if you want to know who the first radical was, you can get the clergy to read you what scripture has to say about the devil." If we had only known all this before, said the conscience-stricken electors, as they shook in their clothes, how differently we should have acted. They wished they could unlearn all their politics that Riley had taught them, and be back in the dark and happy days when they knew nothing, and trusted in the squire's assurance that the vote was of no use to them, and would see that they were kept in their proper station. During three days they had all hated Riley, and now they began to think meanly of him, and they thought the least they could do when they saw Gus come home from London was pull their hair at him and send their dutiful respects to the squire, who was at that moment enjoying the agonies of a batch of liberal poachers, to whom he was reading a patriotic speech by an undersecretary of state, at every line of which the machine in which they were fixed crushed their bones. When Gus had made his father happy by telling him what was in store for Riley, he went off on a surreptitious visit to Dorothy, to whom he meant to propose marriage and get her consent to assist in the downfall of his miserable rival. They kissed one another affectionately, for there was an understanding between them, and Dorothy said, I know you think I have been flirting with Riley, and so I have, but it was all for the best. He wishes to marry me. I know he does, my ownest poppet, answered Augusta, smoothing her bright brown ringlets, and so do I. I know you do, dear one, said she, adjusting her bright brown ringlets and so do others, but I could not honestly marry you both. I would not have you do it, darling, if you could, replied her lover. Indeed, I would rather you did not marry Riley at all. And so would I, said Dorothy, and yet, Augustus Pet, he spoke so distinctly about the happiness which would attend our wedded life, provided our father, I mean my father, could be induced to make handsome settlements. But could anything or any one induce him to do that, Dorothy, he inquired? No, Augustus, she answered with simple truth. I do not think anything or any one could. But let us put the case, my sweetest singing bird, whispered Augustus, that your hard-working and avaricious parents came down with settlements of a munificent, even of a generous description. Let us suppose that he surrounded you with all that the tender heart of a woman could desire, that you had everything in your slap-up style, all round my hat, down to the ground, and up to the knocker in a manner of speaking, Think of what a lot would be yours. 
doomed to live your whole life long in the midst of unbounded and unbridled luxury, you would need to but ring your bell, and several servants would instantly present themselves to know the reason. Think you, fair one, that this would not be Paul. Would you not ere a week long to throw something at somebody, and would not the sense of your responsibility to your inferiors restrain you and be an unmitigated nuisance? How different, my little bubble, your fate would be if you consented to wed with me. My father hates you, even as yours hates me, and neither of them would give us a penny. We should be compelled to borrow at a low rate of interest from persons who required no references. How this would stimulate our activity, how hungry we should often be, and with what a pity this would inspire us for the sufferings of others. And then, when the tide turned, as I dare say it might, and we began to scrape a penny here and a penny there, what joy! Oh, my girl, my comfort, my pretty little simpering twippet to witchet and my pole star, surely this is the life you would prefer. Ah, my Augustus, my Augustus, my Augustus, she answered softly, and if she had said less, she could not have meant more. My own, my dewdrop, she murmured. He spoke rapidly, though not expecting to have got so far in such a short time, and if he had the license in his pocket at that moment, he might have done with her what he would. But he wished to act properly throughout, and he said, My pippinist pet, let us do nothing rashly, lest we come to repent it. Let us not be married till the bands have been called, and the moment the ceremony is over, we will ask the consent of our parents to our union. How good and thoughtful you are, Augustus, said Dorothy. Yes, that is just what we will do. Then he went on to tell her of the scheme which was to confound Riley, and the part they wanted her to play in it, which she gleefully accepted. What this scheme was I cannot tell you just now, for here comes Riley himself, though why he has taken uh, to dressing himself in this conspicuous manner I don't know, for all his bills are still unpaid, and this is what troubles him. He thought that once he had got into Parliament to please Deemster, Deemster would allow him to want for nothing, the fact being that Deemster, having discharged his grudge against Sir Supine, would willingly allow him to want for everything. Riley had never troubled himself about his creditors in his hour of need, and now his creditors did not trouble themselves about him in his hour of prosperity. If you think that the way of the world is different from this, I have no respect for your opinion. They said that he must pay them, or they would make a bankrupt of him. I dare say you have been in debt yourselves, and know what it is to face a thankless creditor. 4. We are now again arrived at the British House of Commons. It is a very foggy afternoon in the middle of the season, and if the House is to deliberate on anything like comfort, the lights must be turned on. By this I mean to say that, though it is only half-past three in the afternoon, it is very nearly dark. A plain, shabby man enters the house, and gropes his way along, swearing under his breath, for he keeps hitting his shins against the furniture. It is, comparatively speaking, only a short time since... Guy Fox groped about in this way with some powder and lucifer matches, thinking to keep up the 5th of November. Is this then another Guy Fox? Hideous, but no. Who then is this mysterious stranger? Well, what if he be no stranger? Strangers are only admitted to the house under very stringent regulations. Why can't you say at once who he is, and put us out of suspense? I will say. It is the man whose business it is to light the house. Ah, what a relief! See, he lights it. But for this man, the house would legislate in total darkness. Horrible! But it is his duty to light the house, and he has lighted it. He never fails in his duty. He has a wife and family to support. He is paid by the week. We now have a notion of what the house looks like on the night of a great debate. It was the night which Riley had secured for his motion to revolutionize the country in a manner already indicated. His head and his pockets were so full of his speech that the policeman on duty declined to let him in till he had submitted himself to be searched. He had some spirits under his coat-tails and some more under his waistcoat, for he wanted to impress the house, and they had told him this was the way to do it. Old Mr. Deemster sat among the distinguished strangers in the gallery, with his spectacles well up on his forehead so as not to miss a word. It was this rich man of the people whom Riley was most anxious to impress— for if he succeeded with his motion, he meant to ask Deemster for the hand of his daughter, and a blank check to wave in the faces of his creditors. 
He went early to be in time for prayers, and the speaker was affected when he entered the house with both arms full of his speech. Young and tender peeresses sat in the ladies' gallery and craned their beautiful heads for a sight of the man who wanted to govern the country by the light of common sense. The reporters with clean paper collars and their hair oiled sat in a row upstairs, and if you had seen them turning their ink-pots over their notebooks and sending off billets to the peeresses, you would have thought, as I often do, that the British press is an institution about which a good deal might be said. Crowds of people were in the street, and Riley's creditors formed a ring twenty-two deep around the house, for they had heard that if he failed, he meant to go to foreign parts by the last train. Ranger, bursting with his plot, was watching Riley from the other side of the house. Four hundred and four questions on subjects which no one was interested in were got rid of, the number being fewer than usual that Riley might have his chance. How often do we observe that something happens which was not expected to happen, and plays the very mischief with something else which ought to have happened? If anything unforeseen were to happen now, Riley might be prevented from making his speech, his political career would infallibly be blasted, and this story would not end as happily as it ought to do, if you consider the reason. If anything unforeseen were to happen now, Riley might be prevented from making his speech. His political career would infallibly be blasted, and this story would not end as happily as it ought to do, if you consider the reason. At the moment when he was looking for the speaker's eye, an attendant of the house entered with a visiting card in his hand. He gave it to the first member he came to, and as it was fingered by one gentleman after another, it grew duskier and duskier in hue. At length it reached Riley, who would like to have repudiated it. Only he dared not, for he knew the house had seen him change color. This was Dorothy's card, and she had written on it a note in pencil telling him to come at once and find her a seat among the ladies, for the minister's secretaries were trying to flirt with her in the lobby. What shall I do with her? thought Riley. If I leave the house now, my chance will be gone, and Deemster will never give me a blank check. What will he do with her? What would any of you have done with her? If only someone would rise and take up the attention of the house for a minute or two. Ranger, who had never removed his eyes from Riley for thirty minutes or less, rose at this moment and asked leave to make a personal statement respecting the Begum of Cawnpore, whose relations with the country were just then somewhat strained. It was a subject to which many earnest men had devoted some of their best and purest thoughts, and the house became hushed in an instant. Riley thanked God for the Begum of Cawnpore. This was not her real name and she did not actually live in Cawnpore, and rushed out, Ranger's attitude suggesting that he meant to speak for an hour and a half. But this Ranger, though a thorough politician, was a very sly man, and when the door had slammed on Riley's coattails, he said he would not occupy the house above a minute, as he knew the honorable member for Poorborough had secured this night for an important speech on the reform of Parliament. He made his statement and sat down on the member next to him, and the speaker called on Riley. Riley did not respond, and when they looked for him, there was no one in his place but a great glass of gin and water, and a speech written only on one side of the paper and two feet high. Riley, poor creature, was rushing up and down the lobby, asking all the persons whom he met if they had seen a girl called Dorothy, with deep blue eyes and a pink dress, this being the costume she generally wore. They had not. No more did Riley, though he spun around both lobbies in a twinkling, and revolved on his own axis till his head swam. The house began to empty. It kept on emptying, and when Riley came back panting after his fruitless search, he met the members pushing one another out by threes, fifteens, and thirty-sixes. He charged them. He said he wanted to make a speech. He struggled. He got mixed up. He was one man against six hundred, and they shook him up like medicine. How often do we think of the adaptability of the human frame to all the pushing, squeezing, kicking, and tearing that go on in the world? If our skeletons were made of anything but bone, it is ten to one we should not live above six years at the utmost. If Riley had died at this age, his life might have been spotless, and he would never have had the humiliation of standing on the floor of the house, with some of his hair off while the speaker counted to see if there was a quorum. For as soon as he got in, and before he reached his seat, he had begun to make his speech, when a secretary to the treasury rose and said there was no house. Then the speaker got up and looked round. Some of the members of the government were sleeping on the front treasury bench, and the leader of the opposition and three others were drawing lots for the estates of the nobility. 
for they thought if Riley's motion were carried that the country would be divided up into portions. Riley jumped up and down and said he would have government by the light of common sense or die for it, and the speaker went on counting one, two, three, and so on up to twelve, this being the number of persons present. Now twelve is not a quorum, and the speaker declared the house adjourned and sent the waiter for a cab. It is no use struggling against constituted authority, least of all against the man whose business it is to turn out the lights, for you might be turned out yourself, as was the case with Riley. The next morning the Proborough truth-teller printed his speech at full length, with cheers and hear here sprinkled up and down the columns, and said that no finer piece of oratory had been heard for some time. But the Proborough truth-seeker, the opposition journal, also came out that morning, described the proceedings in the House, and said that Riley had never made his speech at all. Riley's committee held a meeting at which someone said there was a crisis, and said that things must be looked in the face, and while they were abusing one another across the table, the landlord came in with a face like a mulberry, and asked who was going to pay the drink bill. Then it transpired that all Riley's election expenses were still to pay, and they were heavier than usual, because he had said he would have no bribery. Late that evening, a man with no baggage to speak of, and less hair on his head than he had been accustomed to, presented himself at Old Deemster's, and asked for his daughter's hand in marriage and a blank check, on the ground that the country was in danger from a Tory government, which would have nothing to do with common sense. Such a government, said the stranger, a quiet, serious man, must be turned out with little delay as possible. As there was nothing to prevent old Mr. Deemster from turning Riley out, he did so with the help of his dog. The next day Riley issued another address to the electors, in which he gave them an impartial account of his conduct, and asked for a renewal of their confidence on the ground that Parliament seemed very well content with the present ministers, who ought to be turned out. He said he would at once apply for the Chiltern Hundreds, and he did so, and got them, and a writ was issued for a new election. But when the day of the election came, the only candidate was old Sir Supine Lumpkin, who got all the votes, and a few spurious ones besides. He said, in thanking them, that they might rely on it. He would not forget their recent conduct, and he had hired some new gamekeepers to look after the poachers. Augustus and Dorothy were married at St. George's, much to the disgust of their parents, and the electors expressed themselves willing that Deemster or anybody else should pay Riley's expenses, provided they never saw him again. 5. For they were and are persuaded that their place in creation is a humble one, and they pray that they may be kept in it, and they don't believe in government by the light of common sense or cheap education or free wash-houses, no, nor in the march of events, nor the Irish, and if one goes down there again and offers them three acres and a cow, they will take him by the sleeve and lead him through the town, past the pump, the churchyard, the quiet little alehouse, and Miss Crump's academy, and so on, till they come to the horse-pond. The company were grateful to the quiet man with the pince-nez, for the hearty laughs he had given them, and congratulated each other on the process of evolution by which they had at last secured a story without either ghosts or murders. The company were grateful to the quiet man with the pince-nez for the hearty laughs he had given them, and congratulated each other on the process of evolution by which they had at last secured a story without either ghosts or murders. Their satisfaction, however, was short-lived, for they were betrayed into a political discussion very different in its character from the delicate humor which had provoked it. What was said, and who said it, may not be told here now that the incident has already become ancient history. But if the novelist, who knew little about English politics and cared less, had not skillfully changed the subject in an athletico-literary manner, there would probably have been other broken things on board besides the shaft. The eminent tragedian spent the next day alone, and only one little incident broke its monotony. After lunch he was standing by himself under the bridge when he caught sight of a couple right up on the bows of the vessel. The two lookouts in their yellow oilskins and long sea-boots were stamping up and down their round on the forward deck. But farther forward still, in the very nose of the ship, the reckless young couple were seated, apparently enjoying the full novel excitement of their position. The lady was clad from head to foot in a long grey ulster, and a hat of the same material was tied closely down on the masses of her bright hair, but proved entirely unable to keep the wind from playing havoc with it. 
She was seated on a low stanchion, so that only her head was above the bulwarks and exposed to the force of the wind. Her companion sat behind her upon the lower end of the great wire shroud, running to the foremast head, steadying himself against the bulwarks with his left hand, and with his right grasping the shroud above his head. As the ship pitched, the couple in the bows went up until the vessel seemed to be stretching forward into a great green abyss of swirling waters, and then a moment later they went down and down, and the wave in front came rushing up the bows until it was within a few yards of them. A yard, almost a foot, and the two crouched low, and the man's hand slid gently down the shroud until it was just behind his fair companion, in readiness to grasp her if the rushing water should come any higher. Several times he seemed to relinquish, with reluctance, the necessity of putting his arm around her waist. It was a pretty sight, and the eminent tragedian was heartily sorry when the officer on the bridge caught sight of them, and instantly dispatched the boatswain to bring them back with a severe reprimand. When evening came, the appetite for fiction brought reconciliation, and with many expressions of polite regret that they had not met earlier in the day, the company drew together again in a sheltered spot on the deck. Little though they suspected it, the story they then heard was to be the last. It was this one. End of section 7. Recorded by Paul Coogan, San Diego.